begin, the DLS committee would like to acknowledge that we are gathered here on stolen Ho-Chunk land. The University of Wisconsin-Madison occupies Ho-Chunk land, a place their nation has called to Jope since time immemorial. In an 1832 treaty, the Ho-Chunk were forced to cede this territory. Decades of ethnic cleansing followed when both the federal and state government repeatedly but unsuccessfully sought to forcibly remove the Ho-Chunk from Wisconsin. This history of colonization informs our shared future of collaboration and innovation. Today, UW-Madison respects the inherent sovereignty of the Ho-Chunk Nation, along with the 11 other First Nations of Wisconsin. Please take a moment to consider the many legacies of violence, displacement, migration, and settlement that brings us here today. And please join us in uncovering these truths every day. The Distinguished Lecture Series is an organization committed to bringing the brightest speakers to campus to spread thought-provoking ideas among students, faculty, and the greater Madison community. DLS is one of 11 of the committees comprising the Wisconsin Union Directorate. It is student-run, and as such, all of our programming is designed and marketed by students. For students interested in joining DLS, our committee meets every Tuesday at 5.30 p.m. in Memorial Union throughout the semester. Additionally, if you are interested in our programming, we encourage you to follow us on Instagram, like us on Facebook, and join our email list. Join us in nominating and seeking out new speakers for the next semester. Immediately following tonight's one-hour lecture, there will be a 30-minute Q&A. We encourage questions from all members of the audience. However, we ask that the general audience members hold their questions to give students a, a chance to formulate and ask their questions first. Janice Rice, a member of the Ho-Chunk Nation, has served as a lecturer for the Tribal Libraries, Archives, and Museums course in the spring tw of 2022 at UW-Madison Information School. She is a peacemaker for the Ho-Chunk Nation's trial court, a clan mother for the Ho-Chunk Nation Social Services, past president of the American Indian Library Association, and a board member of the Ho-Chunk Nation Museum and Cultural Center and the Little Eagle Arts Foundation. Janice serves on the Ho-Chunk Curriculum Committee for Indigenous Arts and Sciences, the Earth Partnership Program Grant on Deepening STEM, Indigenized Teaching and Learning. She is an advisor for the Jope Community History Project, which is designed to assist teachers in learning about the Ho-Chunk presence in the Jope Four Lakes and Madison area. During her career, she has worked to promote education, indigenous history, librarianship, civil rights, intellectual freedom, environmental justice, and cultural preservation. She is the recipient of the Woman of Color in Education Arts from UW-Madison and the UW system. Today, Janice is a retired UW academic librarian who remains active in Ho-Chunk historical research, art and museum projects, native language revitalization, and contemporary indigenous issues. Please join me in welcoming Janice Rice. Good evening, everyone. Lila June is a musician, scholar, and community organizer of Diné, Tsetsese, and European lineages. lineages. Her multi genre presentation style has engaged audiences across the globe towards personal, collective, and ecological healing. She blends studies in environmental anthropology from Stanford, graduate work in Native American education, and the traditional worldview she grew up with to inform her music, perspectives, and solutions. She recently completed her PhD dissertation on indigenous regenerative food and land management systems. She strives to honor her ancestors 
by caring for all life and facilitating, facilitating peace and healing within society. Please join me in welcoming Lila June Johnston. I'm going to turn off my phone because I forgot giving us all an opportunity to do that if we want. Okay, so happy to be here. So, so very happy to be here. It's been a long time coming. We've been organizing it for weeks and maybe months, months, definitely months. And here we are. So I'm so grateful to be here with all of you today. Um, I'll introduce myself in the traditional manner first. <clears throat> and I'm very curious what this screen is going to do when I start talking Denebazad. <laughs> nope. Wait. Wait for it. Nope. It just doesn't even want to try. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <clears throat> um, she Lila June Yanishia Nanisht Ejitrachi in Islam. Oh, okay, cool. Oh, yeah, okay, that's cool. Um, Otto Tsessis Bashishi Ashi Hedeshiche Bilagana E Dushinale, um, Taos, New Mexico, Daint Nasha, Aquit Ego de Ne has signed in Islam. So, my name is Lila June. I'm from the Nanisht Ejetrachitni clan of the Dene Nation. We are also incorrectly known as Navajo, um, but that's a distorted Tiwa word that was sort of plastered on us by the outside world. We call ourselves Dene, which means the people. And we have relatives all the way up in Alaska. If you go to California, they speak Denebazad there too. It's pretty crazy. So we're, we're a very big nation, and we took care of a lot of lands. Uh, we still do to the best of our ability. Uh, my father's mother, itch, which is my second clan, uh, my mother's mother is my first clan. In Dene culture, you get your clan from your mother's. You get your last name from your mother instead of your father. So Nanisht Ejitrachitni is my my number one clan. But my father's mother is my second clan and that's the Tsetsis or also incorrectly known as Cheyenne clan of um she was from Anadarko, Oklahoma. Otto um my mother's father's clan is the Salt clan of the Dene and my father's father's clan is the European clans. So I'm a big mixture of things, um, as you know, is common in native communities. Um, in this manner, I present myself as a Dene woman. And I'm so excited to share a little bit of my PhD research with all of you. I'm excited to, more importantly though, just have some time to connect, have some time to be together, have some time to remember what community means, have some time to be in a place where you don't need to be anyone else besides yourself and um, a place of love and, and care. Um, I think that's what my elders would want me to do first and foremost uh, above everything else, to have compassion and kinship with all beings. So that's why when we first introduce ourselves, we say, which means greetings, my relatives, and my people. Because they taught me to see all people as my people, regardless of where they're from, what language they speak, what color of skin they have, that we're all one. We're all one family, we're all one kinship, and we must 
continue to strive to create a world where that is not just true in concept, but true in reality as well. So uh, before I begin, I want to read a poem, um, if that's okay, that I wrote in, in inspired by my grandmother. Um, yeah, because I think poetry can teach more than a PowerPoint ever could sometimes, you know? Okay. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> it is dawn. The sun is rising in the sky and my grandmother and I are singing prayers to the horizon. This morning, she's teaching me the meaning of Honjon, although there's no direct translation from Denebizad, the Navajo language, into English, every living being knows what Honjon means. For Honjon is every drop of rain. It's every leaf on every tree. It's your every eyelash. It's every feather on the bluebird's wing. Honjon is undeniable beauty. And my grandmother knows this well, for she speaks a language that grew out of the desert floors, like red stone arms reaching up into the sky and praising creation for all of its brilliance. I forgot to say Diné people were from the desert. So if you hear, if you see a lot of desert imagery, that's what's going on. But we're from New Mexico, Colorado, Arizona, and Utah. Um, like red stone arms reaching into the sky and praising creation for all of its brilliance. Honjon is remembering that we are a part of the Earth's brilliance. It is remembering that humanity is one expression of the Earth's brilliance. And my grandmother knows this well for she speaks the same language as snowstorms. She speaks the same language as horse hooves hitting the dirt on birthdays. For she was a midwife and she would gallop to the women in labor until she became fluent in the language of suffering mothers, fluent in the language of joyful mothers, fluent in the language of handing a glowing newborn to its creator. Honjon is an experience, she said, but it is not something you can experience alone, the eagles tell us, as they lock talons in the stratosphere and fall to the earth as one during courting season. Honjon is inter-beauty. And my grandmother knows this well, for she speaks the same language as the male rain, which shoots lightning boys through the sky and pummels the green corn children and huddles the horses against the cliff sides in the early afternoon. She also speaks the language of the female rain, which sends the scent of dust and sage into our hogans, into our homes, and casts rainbows in the sky. Us dene, we know what Honjon means. And each and every one of you here you know what Honjon means. And I believe that deep down inside, we know what Honjon does not mean. Like the days we walk in sadness, like the days we walk in fear, like the days we live for money, or like the days when I lived for fame, or like the days when the conquistadors came, when they climbed off of their horses and told us they were going to take the mountains. We knew this was not Honjon, but we knew we could make it Honjon once again. So we took their silver swords, and we took their silver coins, and we melted them with fire and buffalo hide bellows, and recast them into beautiful turquoise and silver jewelry pieces and placed it around their necks. We took the silver helmet straight off of their heads and transformed it into a fiercely, fearless beauty. We made jewelry 
I don't have all my bling on right now. I wish I did. Um, we made jewelry. Jean is like this, my grandmother says. It is the healing of our broken hearts. It is the healing of broken bones. It is the prayer that carried Diné people through genocide, through disease. It is the prayer that will carry us through anything, through a pandemic, through a global climate crisis, through global fear that dances thin as illusion, dividing us in our minds. This morning, my grandmother is teaching me something very important. She is teaching me that sometimes the easiest and most elegant way to defeat an army of hatred is to simply stand before it and sing to it. Sing to it your most beautiful songs until it falls to its knees and surrenders, until it falls to its knees and remembers. It will do this, she says, because it will have finally found a sweeter fire than greed a sweeter fire even than revenge. It will have found heaven. It will have found Honjon. And so, my grandmother is talking to the colors of the sky at dawn, as she does every morning. And she is saying, Honjon na hasli, Honjon na hasli, Honjon na hasli, Honjon na hasli, which means beauty and joy are restored again. It is dawn, my friends. Wake up for the night is over. Was it different signing poetry or kind of the same? I could imagine this song. I wonder if it uses a different part of your brain. I don't know. Um, so, here we go. Uh, I just I just like to to talk about this stuff because it's basically so so exciting to realize when I was you know maybe six years ago that I had been miseducated my whole life about what went on on this continent. Um, before Columbus, before Leif Erikson. And maybe some of you have read the book 1491, anyone? Quite a few, a couple here and there. So it's similar to that in the sense that we're trying to rewrite the narrative, correct the narrative, about just how vast and sophisticated indigenous land management was. Um, and so to me, it's quite exciting stuff. Obviously, I've been nerding and obsessing over it for four years, so maybe, hopefully, it's as exciting to you, too. We'll find out. Um, but by the way, I met Charles Mann the other day, um, the guy who wrote 1491, and he is actually a really sweet guy, turns out, and um, he's going to help me publish this um, in book form. Okay, anyways, let's see. Oh, yes. Okay, I like these ones. Okay. So, we got here, this is an artist rendition of Florida Riverbanks, where they have these massive archaeological sites showing vast shell middens, these places where the ancestors would deposit their shells after eating them, and just gives you a little, you know, imaginary, the, the, the shells are as big as they were, but obviously the artist's rendition of how massive this oyster um, uh, endeavor was. And we have also archeological evidence showing it was a 3,000 year old oyster fishery. So I just like that photo. I like to start it out with that. So I'm gonna start out actually by talking about Kentucky. Um, I don't know if y'all have heard of the American chestnut tree, but it is this used to be a massive old growth orchard from Maine all the way down to Georgia and even lower into northern Florida, but and, and even to the east, to Kentucky and, and other eastern states. So these, this is a picture of a, of a chestnut grove back in the day. 
Um, right now, the chestnut is almost, uh, the American chestnut is almost completely extinct due to a blight that wiped it out because Americans did not know how to manage the forest uh, correctly. So um, here's a, a Tsalagi family standing next to a massive chestnut as well. And here's an artist rendition of a massive chestnut tree. So I wanted to talk about how in Kentucky, they pulled out a soil core from a pond and they could see all of the fossilized pollen from these chestnut trees that had fallen over the past 3,000 years. Um, and they also found other types of pollen. So this graph actually shows the different fossilized pollen amounts over time. So the lower part is you know, 9,500 years ago. And as you go up, the soil core gets newer and newer and newer. And so as you can see in the cedar, about 3,000 years ago, the cedar kind of disappears. And 3,000 years ago, the oak makes a rebound. And interestingly, chestnut comes out of nowhere. Well, where did that come from? Hickory nut, black walnut, and some medicinal plants and um, domesticated plants, goosefoot, uh, plantain dock, etc. There's little bits of it. What's really interesting is this part here. You see fossilized charcoal. Um, this is charcoal uh, frequency in the in the sediment record, and you see um, this massive influx that is sustained uh, for a long time. And the reason this is uh, they surmised was because Shawnee ancestors, the indigenous folks of Kentucky, managed this forest with routine fire. Now, what does fire do to a chestnut grove? Well, what you would do is you would burn around the, the, the root, or rather the trunk of the tree and in between, and this would eliminate competing vegetation from taking over the chestnut trees. It also turns all of the dead grasses in the fall into nutrient-dense ash, which nourishes the soil, nourishes the microbial network, uh, brings charcoal into the soil, which helps stimulate microbial activity. And it also creates forage, because in the wake of that burnt ground comes nutrient-dense grasses, right? We know this metaphor of rising from the ashes stronger, more nutrient-dense. So you'd have, in between the chestnut groves, you'd have meadows and grasslands and who loves nutrient-dense grass? But herbivores like deer, and in this case, southern bison. And they would munch on that. So you were creating a chestnut grove and also expanding habitat for herbivores at the same time. And so this part hadn't been burned, it looks like. <laughs> they needed to maybe burn this debris. Um, but this was very common, and I'll get into more fire. This research has basically turned me into a pyromaniac. Uh, I just wanna, I'm like, that looks like that needs to be burned. Uh, but actually fire prevents fire. Um, so we, we're all scared of fire, right? We've been conditioned to be scared of fire. It's just kind of scary. But when you don't do fire, you get massive fires. And so the fires we're seeing in the US and Australia and other parts of the world are not simply due to climate crisis, they're also due to the prohibition of indigenous fires, which has led to a huge fuel um, buildup over the centuries. I'm gonna switch gears and go to Bolivia. Um, so this is a, another interesting land management technique whereby the Baude people would manage these floodplains. So the water would come up in the wet season and in the dry season, it would get caught by these fish weirs and earthen berms, all made out of earth. Um, and on the earth berms, they would plant fruit trees and these fruit trees would attract game animals and you would have this fish weir here. So when you wanted to catch a fish, you just open the thing and the fish uh, swim through and you catch one or two on the way out. Um, they had massive canal systems. They had uh, ring ditches. They had raised beds. They had these cute little reservoirs. So in the dry season, they'd have huge ponds 
where the fish would stay, so you'd have a perennial supply of fish. Um, this was a massive effort. Um, and the, this is an aerial view of some of the massive, you know, kilometers long earthen berms that were created that were exposed once the logging started happening. And this is the area, this is the floodplain where this black dotted line is that was managed. It was just massive, it was like the country of Bolivia, right? So this was a massive feat that was um, managed sustainably. Um, we know in the archeological record, it was a centuries old system, perhaps older. And it was pretty phenomenal. Um, I'm gonna switch gears again. I forget where I point, the, wait, did I go too far? Okay, so this is my homeland. This is actually a desert area. So what you have here is you plant your fields at the base of small watersheds so that every time the monsoon rains come, they wash down the hillsides and fill up your field, not just with water, but with fertilizers and nutrients that the water is carrying down from upland soils. So you have, it's a funny diagram, I say weather, <laughs> uh, watershed, um, and then the soil and the crop and blah, blah, blah. So the water will come down from the upland soils. And this soil here is very loamy, has a lot of um, forest duff, you know, a lot of um, organic material that gets washed in. And they did some studies and found that these infield areas had way higher nitrogen, phosphorus, soil organic matter content than, uh, than the surrounding areas, obviously. So... This was this is called alluvial farming or runoff agriculture, and it's practiced most heavily studied uh, when the Shiwi folks do it, um, AKA Zuni Pueblo people, but also carried out by the Hopi as well as Diné, as well as pretty much anyone in the desert realized that you wanna you wanna dovetail, you know what nature is already doing. You wanna go where the mother is already flowing. You don't need to pipe water out somewhere else. You don't need to um, force her to be yours, but rather, why don't you try to be hers instead? So I really quite like this system because it turns deserts into oases and it uh, allows them to plant the same field without ever going fallowed for centuries. They found one field that was a thousand years old so you don't have to import any outside irrigation or fertilizer for this technique. Um, yeah, I've seen a couple of them. They're quite beautiful. Um, there's much more to say on that topic, but um, maybe for another time. We're going to go to Australia. We have here uh, the uh, Gunditjmara eel farms. This wall is 6,000 years old. Um, they've been funneling eels. Here's a little eel funnel, so when the eel swims in, they can catch the eel and, and, and eat it. Um, but they see the eel as their sacred relative. So the eel is not just a thing you catch, it's their relative. And that seems to be common across the case studies, is that we see animals as people in another form. And not only just people, but our family in another form. It's, some people call it a kin-centric ecology. It's centering the kinship of things. Um, this is an ancient system. Um, whoops, going too far. So they actually, um, the, the eel is a freshwater and saltwater species, so they actually go to the ocean to spawn, and they go to the springs, or rather the tributaries and the rivers to uh, mature. They're the opposite of a salmon, actually. A salmon does the opposite, but uh, they're catadromous versus andromous, uh, and anandromous. So um, what's really cool about this is they didn't just have to manage the upland tributaries. They had to make sure that the mouth of the river where it meets the sea was healthy. It's a regional holistic stewardship process. They understood everything's connected from the ocean to the rivers up into the in interior all that had to be healthy for these eels to come and go. Now, the Gundichmara eel farm was obliterated and drained by colonial forces. Uh, and just within the past 20 years, they took away those drains 
and they brought the eel back. So it's a very exciting story, a success story, and I wish we could have more of those here in you know, what we call the United States. So this is a more fire stuff. So I called it American Grasslands Pyromanagement, and I'll just read this quote. The Illinois Confederacy shaped and altered much of this region as an anthropogenic creation. Like many other indigenous groups in North America, their most important tool was fire. Burning the prairies, they made the grasses hospitable for grazers and managed the prairie as a game reserve to maximize productivity. Meaning, they turned the area into a grassland, which then became a game reserve although you might call it creating a home for your kin. Um, because just as much as the herbivores um, fed us, we too had to work to feed them by burning seasonally. And this was such an important practice that we even named one of our moons after it. So the Miamia Nation, I don't know if anyone ever heard of the Miamia Nation, Amazing people, indigenous to the Ohio River Valley. They have an incredible Miami center at the University of, of Miami in Ohio. And they're just my heroes. So they have their September moon is called a grass burning moon. And it's been called that for thousands of years because every September it would burn the grasses. And this is a picture from one of their... Um, little books, and um, one of the things they say is that this is the name of the grass burning moon. In Sasha Kayolia Kilshwa, we see fire as something that restores and gives new life to the prairie. Fire helps clear the land of old grass and brush and opens seed pods that have fallen to the ground because of fire, or rather, because of fire, new flowers and plants emerge in the spring. So fire has this life-giving property, which is fascinating to me. And, and, and also, the good thing about saving indigenous languages is encoded within those languages are things like this, right? Um, things that tell us what the people used to do every September, every October, every April, every whenever, every moon had a name for different nations and different nations had different names for different moons, but they were a reflection of the stewardship styles of that bioregion. So it's just so cool. And I'm just so excited about all the language revitalization work that Janice does and that we should support all Ho-Chunk people in doing. Um, so this is a wonderful book I'd highly recommend. Uh, Forgotten Fires. Native Americans in the transient wilderness. Transient meaning the wilderness never lasted very long. It was constantly tended, it was constantly gardened, it was constantly managed. Um, this was written in 1908, but was recently republished. This guy was way ahead of his time, Omer Stewart. And state by state goes by all these firsthand accounts of explorers and soldiers and colonizers who were like, Gosh, they're just burning everything, you know? Um, and this is a buffalo pasture in Texas. If you go there now, it's all shrubs, shrubland and mesic forests. So what's really fascinating about this, the Great Plains, is that fire, routine fire, applying a little layer of ash to the soil every year for centuries over time creates very deep topsoils. One um, explorer said four foot deep topsoils in Montana. Um, and this soil has an, uh, a faster water infiltration rate. So when it rains, it just, it's like a sponge, it just soaks it in. So I realized just by deductive reasoning that we can thank the routine burning of indigenous peoples for the Oglala Aquifer at least in part, because if it wasn't for that constant renewal of the soil systems, that rain wouldn't have gone so deep to make these gigantic aquifers um, that were later and are still exploited by commercial agriculture. So it's really fascinating how fire and water have this connection to each other. Um, we're gonna go to the American South. Uh, the cane ecosystems, 
which are actually, uh, cane is another word for bamboo. I did not know we had an indigenous bamboo species in the United States or Turtle Island, uh, better said. And I had no idea, but bamboo uh, is actually one of the foundational materials for all the Southern tribes and the Southeastern tribes. Um, it is now estimated to be less than 2% of its original habitat. So the cane has been severely uh, decimated. Um, and they would, would and still do make all kinds of implements. Uh, it was basically, it was like the, the stock of their culture. You know, it's like what they, they, they were the cane and the cane was them. And to have it disappear obviously was very hard. Um, so what's really interesting about cane is that it needs to be disturbed. If you let it grow on its own, it chokes itself out, it starts competing for limited nutrients and water in the soil, it starts competing for limited sunlight, so they all shoot up really high to the canopy to just get a little bit of light, and it collapses into itself. So it needs to be constantly like run over <laughs> or burned, <laughs> um, or a flood or something to open up the canopy and help those culms sprout new shoots. So um, indigenous peoples would burn uh, the cane frequently, and there's really interesting studies showing how when colonial society came in, they would measure the um, quality of the soil based on how tall the cane was, because they knew, of, okay, if the natives were here, with their cane stuff going on, the soil's really good. And the cotton industry, interestingly, raised a lot of the bamboo and replaced it with cotton because that was the best soil um, in, in the house, so to speak. So what loves bamboo forage but the southeastern bison? We often think of the bison being a Great Plains thing, but actually this is a map showing the estimated bison belt there was bison way down south into Mexico that we know of, and as far east as Pennsylvania. And this was done partly by native people expanding that habitat, burning those grasslands, creating forage. So the, the forage that was created for them in the south was the bamboo. So you have the human fire burning the cane, which sprouts new cane, which feeds the buffalo, which feed the humans, which feed the cane, which feed the buffalo, which feed the human, blah, 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 blah. And also the cane and the fire creates these nutrient dense and stabilized soil systems. Anyone ever lived in the South? I was telling Janice, I was like, oh yeah, I was living in Alabama for a while. She was like, oh no. And I was like, <laughs> or, or when I was living in Alabama, I'd be like, yeah, I'm in Alabama. They'd be like, are you okay? Do you need a ride home? Like, no, I'm fine, I live here. Um, but anyways, it's very, very wet. There's a lot of rain all the time. So this bamboo would help to stabilize the soil system. Oh, let me, let me just take a breath before we go to the water, please. So moral of the story, let's bring back the cane, right? Um, not just for the earth, but for the animals and for the people and for the whole system, which has been in shock without the cane for a long time. Um, oh, and should say there's invasive cane now, there's Asian cane, which apparently is, what's the word? It's very hard to get out. The roots are much deeper. It's very vigorous. So there's probably hybrid species now, which is fine, I, I'm a hybrid species, but um, I think it's good to, bring back the native cane as well. Okay, so going to Piscataway territory. Um, anybody know where Piscataway people are from? Yes, DC, Washington, DC. Those are the indigenous peoples of Washington, DC. Um, so what we know is we've seen these massive archeological sites that just go on for kilometers of shells. And so these scientists, uh, basically measured every single shell, thousands of them, looked how old they are, looked how big they are, and then published it in the Smithsonian and said ancient Native American methods may be key to sustainable oyster harvests. And we said, yes, we've been saying that for decades, but now that the Smithsonian says it, it's true, whatever. 
Um, we'll take it. So um, they found that these were ancient, 3,500 years. Oh, I should say, these aren't just natural. People deposited these shells here. These are shell middens, so they are directly correlated with human eating and depositing. So, and they weren't just trash heaps, apparently. I talked to some elders. They said, no, they were sacred. The, tr the shell middens were part of our gift to the earth, and they even had burial sites in, in Berkeley in their shell mounds. So they're not just trash heaps. But anyways, 3,500 years of continual harvesting, eating, and depositing of oyster shells in the Chesapeake Bay, where present-day Washington, D.C. sits. So it's just mind-boggling to think how these people were eating oysters almost twice as long ago as when Jesus was here. And so it's amazing that this was not only sustained, but over time the shell size actually augmented. So the shells actually got bigger. Now I have a little bit of sad news for you. Uh, in the past not even 300 years of American management, the oyster population is down to less than 1% of its original size. It's almost extinct. We need to do some serious oyster mitigation ASAP and put the Piscataway away at the lead. So now we're going to Vancouver in British Columbia. And there's this really special nation that I always have to shout out because they let me come to their homeland called the Heltsuk. And the Heltsuk people here are creating herring row farms, you could say. Um, and this herring is a little silver fish and they lay their row on any surface area they can find during uh, spawning season, which is in February. And so they'll just litter everything with, with eggs. So what these folks do is they submerge hemlock tree boughs in the water by the hundreds and they put them in there and it's sort of a way to attract the herring to lay the eggs and then they get to harvest the eggs uh, in a way that doesn't kill the herring. Uh, a lot of the commercial fishers will catch the herring by the thousands, cut them open, dump out the eggs and throw the dead herring off overboard. So this is a non-kill, no-kill <laughs> way. Um, sort of like, yeah, of course, you don't kill the, the mother who feeds you. But anyways, the same herring fish uh, can come back and lay eggs many, many times if you let her live. Um, and so it's so cool. They also, here's the herring spawning. Here's the hemlock, the sort of the fruit of the ocean. Um, it's really quite delicious and nutritious. And uh, when you put it, when it's laid on the hemlock, it has this kind of piney, pine taste to it. Um, they also submerge giant kelp into the water, uh, which grows some insanely fast meters per week, or I don't know, maybe decimeters per week, but very fast. And it grows in the coastal region, so they'll actually plant, hand plant kelp forests all around the, the coastline, and then the herring will plaster those with eggs. So in this manner, they manage to increase the surface area upon which the herring can lay their row, which is a way of single-handedly enhancing the ecosystem. So one of my health sick friends, Vina Brown, says, we not only not harmed the earth, we made it better. Um, she said, I'm not about sustainability. Sustainability is just keeping things as they are. We were about enhanceability. Can you leave the earth more vibrant, more alive than you found it? And every single one of these cases proves that we can. We are completely capable of doing that. We can do it again. So now I'm going to go to the Amazon, and I think this is the last example. So I'll spare you. This is, I won't give you any more after this. Um, because I know uh, it's a lot of information. So this is the Mebengocre uh, peoples of Brazil. And these little black dots are everywhere where they found terra preta, or dark earths. Um, and this is the deep topsoil they find in the Amazon river basins. Now, I didn't know this, but apparently the Amazon is actually one of the most nutrient-poor soil systems in the world. It's really hard to grow stuff. There. I thought it would be the opposite. 
but they managed to transform these really clayey soil systems into vibrant, living, breathing topsoils. And they do so through a very extensive composting technique, intercropping technique, burning, um, and also putting their ceramics into the soil as well. And so they create these beautiful topsoil systems. And what we've come to understand, or what I should say, what Western scientists have come to understand, is that um, the Amazon rainforest, as we know it, is by and large an anthropogenic creation, meaning it's not wild or natural. It's actually a product of human gardening on a landscape scale. Because without this constant renewal of soils, um, a lot of these plant and animal communities wouldn't exist. So some of the takeaways are habitat expansion. You know, how do you expand the habitat for your food? In our case, your relatives. It's not a food system, it's a kinship system. How do you um, make more area for the buffalo? Instead of caging your food or building a corral around it, why don't you just make a home for it and it comes to you? How do you make a home for life? You know, oops. Reciprocity, you know, feeding the hand that feeds you, giving back. What a crazy concept, right? Um, and I don't think it's our fault as colonial society that we don't even see that as a goal. Right now, the goal is profit maximization. Um, very explicitly, it's just, I remember going to econ class. That was the goal. And I just, I got a C. I thought they were crazy and they thought I was crazy. Reciprocity is born of safety and, and, and trust. Whereas profit maximization is born of 2,000 years of open warfare that ravaged Europe before Columbus was ever born. Our scarcity mentality is born of war. And we as Europeans, because I'm also European, we have a lot of work to heal that part of us, to, to let go and to trust, to have kinship again. Holistic management, not just managing an oyster farm, but managing a whole estuary. Not just planting a garden, but planting a whole forest. Not just managing an acre of floodplain, but managing an entire basin. Thinking on um, landscape scales is kind of connected to holistic management. Millennial scales, you know, these were all thousand or more year old systems, every single one of them, meaning they have a track record and they worked. Of course, there was instances where we did not, where, where things did not work, right? That's what Jared Diamond likes to write about. <sighs> that guy. Um, I, I need, he's like the one guy I can't forgive. Um, because a lot of the archaeologists like to focus on ways that native people collapse and they don't know what they're doing and Easter Island, da 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 da. But these were actually exceptions to the rule, at least in my research. And when we did collapse, it's interesting, we harness that and metabolize that as a learning moment. We learned to be more sustainable after collapse. Because when you touch a hot stove and you get burnt, you realize don't touch that stove anymore. So there's all kinds of instances where native civilizations flourished and collapsed. I actually descend from one of them, Chaco Canyon. And Chaco Canyon is really exciting to a lot of people. It's a archeological site, a massive city with five-story buildings that used to be there um, in New Mexico. And, but my people, we don't ever go back there because that's where we had caste systems, that's where we enslaved people, that's where the high priests were better than everyone else, and the creator, uh, or the Dien Dene, or however you wanna say it, the story is that they sent us a drought to give us the courage to change, and dismantled that whole city, and it fell to dust. And we don't see that as a bad thing. <laughs> uh, when we abandoned that place, we vowed to never go back, not just geographically, but socially, to never go back 
to that way of living. Um, and so a lot of, and now we have, in Diné culture, we have, eh, you know, clans and kinship, meaning we're all equal. So we went from caste system to we're all equal. And sometimes you need a big old drought to help you get there. Sometimes you need a catastrophe to humble you. Same was true for the Mayan civilizations. All the archaeologists scratching their heads, where do the Mayans go? What I was told by the elders is, uh, no one asked the Mayans, but what, <laughs> they're actually still here, but what I was told is that they left the cities to go to the forest because they realized they were not God. And they had massive cities, um, gorgeous cities, air conditioner, running water, having the running water run over where the wind blew, like air conditioning, like incredible engineering, architecture, astronomy, as we know the Mayan calendar being far more advanced than their Galilean counterparts. Um, just incredible cities, and they left the city. Can you imagine the faith it would take to leave your city where you have everything and be humble and be a child of the earth rather than uh, her master? So it's amazing how this all worked. And the mound building civilizations, too, one of the interviewees in my dissertation who I'm so indebted to for teaching me so much, he's a traditional descendant of the mound builders. He said, you know, my dad's so proud of being from a mound builder people, but my grandma says, no, that's when we messed up because the high priests would live on top of the mounds and they were trying to get close to the face of God, he said. And they finally got up there and God said, what the heck are you doing? And they abandoned, they had catastrophes as well. They abandoned these cities. And so this world has, at least according to our traditions, a way of um, naturally reordering itself, leveling the fields, if you will. Usually, literally, whenever there's a pyramid or a mound coming on, it's like something's going wrong. It's like leveling things and um, learning about egalitarian society. So now you go to the Muscogee, they have a Dalwa system, a decentralized kinship-based governance system. So they too were humbled. Uh, and so in this time of crisis, I don't always see it as a negative thing. I see it as our gift. And it is too bad we're taking so much down with us. But I think this is, um, as, as our Dene elder said, part of the Dene way of understanding the universe is trial and erudition. There's always trials and from that comes learning. So I think we're actually right on time to get humbled right about now. And so I, I encourage us to embrace it and have faith, take care of each other in this time and, and, and be open to the, to the deeper lessons that this time has to give us right now. Um, okay, consent, free will based, meaning, again, we didn't cage our food. I think I kind of already said that. Have, that's, that's just related to this one, right? Like we didn't cage it, it was the buffalo came to us. You know, there's, you always hear that in, in indigenous societies all over. If, if a salmon, if you catch a salmon, the salmon gave itself to you. If you catch a whale, the whale gave itself to you. If you catch a deer, the deer gave itself to you. So there's this, this consent and reciprocity. Um, and a stewardship mentality, of course. So, uh, I'm gonna skip that because I'm out of time. Um, this is sort of my ultimate hope is that we reframe the narrative from what most people know to Turtle Island being a densely populated, extensively managed continent. Instead of before what it's been is a few half naked nomads running around looking for a berry to eat or a deer to hunt and eking out a living on the land which is just not true. And it also erases thousands of years of our heritage to say that. And um, in addition to that, it robs society of a whole, as a whole, of the lessons that are embedded in these systems, the lessons that we could learn today to solve our most pressing challenges, catastrophic fire, catastrophic flooding, um, the climate crisis, of course, uh, soil erosion, all these things could be healed through indigenous management techniques. And my hope and my prayer is that our medicine will continue to come out to help uh, neo-colonial society, as it were. Um, 
So I'm going to sing a song, and then I think we're going to go to Q&A. So take a breath, and, um, and we'll do that. I think like a lot of native people, we can't figure out what we want to be when we grow up. So we just kind of be a lot of things. So that's why I'm like singing too, because I just I like to sing. But thank you all for being here tonight. And thank you all for giving me a little bit of your time. This time always flies by. Is that close enough to the drum? Oh, it turned on. Yeah, good, okay. Indigenous people, shine your light, we are equal, yeah, yeah. I remember the days when being Indian was lethal. I remember the days when our prayers were illegal, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we had a rough past, but get ready for the sequel. Get ready for the glorious comeback of our people, oh, yeah. Rise up, all you warriors of love, all you answers to the prayers of our ancestors from above. I could feel it in my heart, can you feel it in your blood? I could hear the seventh fire calling us to wake up. All nations rise. Rise up, cause now's your time. We don't have to hide anymore, cause now's our time. With forgiveness as my bow and my prayers as my arrows, pull it back and let it go. I watch them fly like sparrows. Have hope, have hope. With compassion as my shield and faith down to my marrow, I will walk the pollen path even when it gets narrow. Yeah, yeah. Resurrect. Yes, you can bet that we seen the single mama raising children on the rest. We seen domestic violence tear apart what we have left. We seen the alcohol take it all and leave us dead. We've seen the children take their lives when they can't take the dread anymore. Can't take the dread anymore. Or no, we can't take the dread anymore. Cause I can't take the dread anymore. Yes, it's a war, but we've seen it all before, and now we know we can change it, cause that's why we were born. We know we are the ones that we have been waiting for, yes, we are the ones that grandma has been praying for, so rise up. All you warriors of love, all you answers to the prayers of our ancestors from above. I could feel it in my heart, can you feel it in your blood? I could hear the seventh fire calling us to wake up. Pueblo hermoso, levántanse, es nuestro tiempo. No tienes que esconderte más, porque ahorita es nuestro tiempo. This next verse is in Spanish to honor all the indigenous peoples who live south of the imaginary border, um, which has divided a continent that was once very much connected. 
mujer indígena Tú eres tan sagrada y traigas medicina de tu suelo todavía A pesar del abuso de tu cuerpo y tu tierra Respetamos tus ancestros y la suya cultura, hombre indígena Tú eres honorable y yo veo la fuerza que todavía sobrevive A pesar del abuso de tu raza venerable Yo respeto tus ritos, tus danzas, tus padres Guerreros del amor y guerreros de la paz Sí, no vamos a escondernos más We are warriors of love, we are warriors of peace And we will not hide ourselves anymore All nations rise, rise up, cause now's your time. We don't have to hide anymore, cause now's our time. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. So if we, if we want to, we have some time for Q&A. Um, I actually have a lot of time. Usually they don't leave so much time. It's gonna be nice. So any comments or questions are more than welcome to be asked. I guess we have two microphones on either side. Um, and if you wanted to ask any questions, you're welcome to. Um, and I think we are um, really encouraging students to ask questions. But of course, others are welcome to ask as well. Maybe we all just need to take a few breaths. <laughs> Thanks for, thanks for making the trek. Yeah, <laughs> that's cool. I, uh, I just want to say thank you. I appreciate your presentation, and I'm a grad student, graduate student here at UW Madison. I'm studying indigeneity in Southeast Asia, and uh, we have this burning, or <laughs> we, um, the indigenous people in Southeast Asia also have this burning practice that they call it Swidden agriculture. Yes. And they've been discriminated for practicing it as destroying the forest, so that misunderstanding. So thank you for talking about the pyro management. Um, I'm wondering about when you referenced in uh, knowledge within that's decoded within indigenous language, which I appreciate because that's a great way to encourage young people to learn their language. And I was wondering, where you uh, discovered that and, uh, and how does that also, or do you see that informing or collaborating with some of this research where we're utilizing indigenous language or decoding that knowledge? Mm -hmm. Or do you feel that that should be research within uh, the specific cultures? If mm -hmm. you know what I mean, yeah. But but yeah, I was just wondering how it, how do you discover it and how it works with some of the, your research, or can it? Yeah, M may I ask what your native nation is? Oh yes, <laughs> my name's Tu Saik, and um, I'm part of the Hmong Hmong yeah. people. Yeah, 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 yeah. Nice. Yeah, I was recently with a Hmong sister at a Indigenous people women's gathering, and it was nice. so good to see that global indigeneity thing happening, because we are all, all indigenous, right? We're not always all indigenous to where we're standing, but we all have indigenous roots, and it's a global phenomenon. And they were burning in Norway, too. They're burning in Africa. They're burning. It's a very global phenomenon. And I think that in terms of language, I mean, I get a little depressed talking about language because of of the tens of thousands of different native languages that used to be spoken in the US and Canada, there's only 230 left being spoken. And of those 230 some, only 30 are being spoken by the children. 
So only 30 are actually living languages. Um, so I get depressed every morning when I wake up a little bit about like, oh, wow, you, we're watching these languages slip through our fingers. Our generation will be the ones who decide if we have any 50 years from now, frankly. Um, so the, the, the thing about the language, though, uh, I, I mean, there's obviously a lot I could say, but I think I'll just answer with this one story. Um, I was able to... Uh, interview a Muscogee language immersion instructor for the dissertation. And he said that um, in native language teaching, what we often do is say, well, we don't do all these native practices anymore, so we don't need those words anymore. And now we have computers and phones and microphones, so we need to make new words for all the new stuff we have. And he was saying that he doesn't agree with that approach, that instead of fitting the native language to fit a Eurocentric lifestyle, we should fit our lifestyle to fit the, the indigenous language, the old language. So for instance, they have a moon as well, the burning moon in the fall. And he said the language is like a prescription of what we should do. So I think, um, understanding that the language is, I love what he said, the language is our leader. The language is our guide of how to live on the land. And I think that's how it's all encoded, is it's just naturally encoded. When you live in the same place for that long, you're gonna start to have this understanding of that land, which you develop within the language. So I think, I can't stress enough how exciting and important our generation is this opportunity to save these languages. And I, I really hope for the day when the US taxpayer dollars fund language immersion schools, which seem to be the only things that actually save a language. So I think the United States has done a great deal to, to, to nearly wipe out all of our languages. And I think it would be good to, to, to invest in them, to repair that. Um, will that ever happen? I don't know. They'll probably say, hey, use your casino money. And we'll say, hey, actually, we don't have any casino money. That's a myth. Um, <laughs> the loan sharks came and made us get the casinos, and now we're all in debt. But anyways, that's another story. Um, so I think, the, obviously, the language will be the leader. And I'm, very, I'm sure you have a lot to say. Is there anything you want to share about your indigenous language and how it leads in any no. way? Do you speak yeah. Hmong? Yeah, uh, yeah they, there's uh, Hmong language classes here. And first, I, I just wanted to say, before I forget, I, I understood your, your bling reference earlier. I laughed at it. Um, mm. I, and I was wondering what the, uh, the sign language for bling was. But in any case, <laughs> um, <clears throat> the, my, I appreciate that you referenced gr uh, grandmothers, because mm -hmm. my grandmother did a uh, Hmong poetry chanting. Mm -hmm. And I remember I couldn't understand, even though I could speak and understand Hmong, I couldn't understand her words because she's using a lot of metaphors. Yeah. And now that I'm studying, uh, and, and she, she has joined the ancestors a few years ago, but now I'm studying in advanced Hmong language. One of my friends asked me, oh, are you going to be learning uh, this like uh, high-level academic Hmong language? And I said, no, no. In advanced Hmong language, we actually start learning poetry and mm -hmm. storytelling. That's mm -hmm. advanced Hmong language. <laughs> and within that, she said, that's uh, you start to unlock all the indigenous knowledge mm -hmm. of the agriculture. Mm -hmm. And so I think that going back to your point of how it uh, is encoded, mm -hmm. I think that that's a great way as far as uh, thinking about it in environmental terms by learning indigenous language we can uh, encode that knowledge to uh, support the environment. So, so mm -hmm. I can see the value of that. Um, I think it's still a newer concept, but I did learn it from the, uh, another scholar named Manuela Pig, who was studying Quechua mm -hmm. people. And she was talking about how language uh, unlocks, indigenous language unlocks an imagination that frees itself from colonial language, mm -hmm. like a worldview. Mm -hmm. So I do see the value in indigenous language in that sense. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. So.
Thank you so but much thank for you. your question. Yeah. Appreciate it. Anyone is welcome to ask a question if you want. No pressure. Um, and the grandmothers, one of my friends said, um, there's a reason they call it the mother tongue. You know, not to say our fathers aren't an integral part of everything, but the, the mother has a special role in, in the grandmother in imparting that and, and, and embodying that knowledge. So. Thank you. Thanks. Hey. Thanks for the presentation. I think it was really great to see this and hear this. One of the, as, as a lot of, of our communities, especially those who are of indigenous origins and, and connections, land has to do with everything. Mm -hmm. Uh, land continues to be uh, a struggle and, and a fight. Consistent, I mean, even here in the city of Madison is, is, a, is a particular example of that. So when we talk about these practices of regenerations and really thinking about how we think ahead, you know, how we're thinking ahead for our children and our grandchildren, what does this really mean when we're still struggling for the lands that either have been taken, have mm -hmm. been, were this dispossessed or moved from? Thank yeah. you. Thank you for your question. Yeah, I mean, there's like this land back thing, right? Of like this beautiful movement that's going on where people are just literally like giving their houses away in their land bases, whether they're churches or private landowners or universities or whatever. There's this push, um, which is not a given. It took a lot of generations of hard work to kick this movement off but there's also people back right like the land needs us back um and the land can't be herself without us um and i think what this research journey has taught me the most well there's many things but one of the big ones is that each and every species has a role and one time my elder was look, looking at me in Fort Peck Reservation and he said, everything has a purpose. He said, that rock has a purpose, that deer has a purpose, that star has a purpose, this grass has a purpose, every, every animal. And he, and he looked at me and he said, and every human. And it was like, you know, like, why do we leave ourselves out of that hoop, you know? Of like, yeah, we can easily imagine the butterfly has a purpose, pollinates the flowers, right? But for humans, we're like, oh no, we don't have a purpose. We're just this pest, this um, misfit of creation, this, this problem child. We're not really supposed to be here. We just mess everything up. I think no. I think the earth needs us as much as she needs the butterflies. When we are acting in right relations, when we are able to get coyotes' weight off of us and be what we are, we are medicine to the earth. And so it's not just land back, but it's people back. Um, you go to the national forests, they're all overgrown. Uh, one of the elders in the dissertation said, we used to have about 13 trees per acre was his stewardship style of his people. And he said, now I look on my land and there's hundreds of trees per acre. You need the humans in there thinning it and gardening it, just like any garden. You don't want it all to grow too thick because you want a few healthy ones versus many sick trees. And so um, I think the earth does need us and that these brains are not an accident, but it's the creator's um, instrument to steward the land. But I, I get your deeper point, which is how this is all fine and great, but until we have the land back, how are we going to do this? And I think that's a good point. And that's why I give this speech all the time, because I'm like trying to facilitate that process of like, maybe we should give native people a chance at uh, leading their own lands. Maybe we should give Native people a chance to be the, uh, the, the heads of you know, national forests. The heads, I love Deb Holland being at the um, head of the Department of the Interior, although she did uh, endorse my opponent when I ran for office. She was a little salty about that, it's okay. <laughs> uh, who was not a Native woman, it was like the opposite. Um, <laughs> I will, but I'm still glad she's there because she, I hope, is not the first to hold that position as an indigenous person. And I hope that many other small, smaller agencies and 
also, you know, realizing that we are, I love the land acknowledgement, we're on stolen land, it's so pointed, I've never heard one like that. And then how do we put that into action? How do we return those lands in a way that doesn't dispossess others, because we don't want to do the same thing to others that the world did to us, but in a way, there's enough, there's enough for everyone, and that's part of that trust and that faith. So I think you're absolutely right, and the only thing to say is, yeah, we need to give the land back to Native nations. I mean, I hope this presentation proved why that would be a good idea. And she's first. Hello, uh, I wanna say thank you. I actually was uh, suggested your TED talk by the inner workings of the inner web. And then the next day I found out that you were coming to UW Madison and it felt a little bit like fate. Uh, <laughs> Nice. So thank you, and I want to thank you uh, about your poem of the Hajang and uh, what you do. Um, I am a person who is inheriting land that I will not own, and I have tried to figure out how to uh, donate that land to young peoples of like the Native Ojibwe tribe near me. Um, and I say that not because it um, it matters as an action for others to follow, it does not matter for me as a person. I'm not doing anything with it. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And I want to uh, ask you about how we can install um, and support local native groups um, for the education. Um, I remember um, native people were the only diversity I grew up with. Um, and it was beautiful, and I was always so grateful to hear their culture and have it shared with me. Um, and they experienced a lot of things like you of like losing culture um, within their areas. And I would love to hear about how you fought for your culture or how you've had outside support and how we can best support um, giving you your culture back. Mm. That's a multi multifaceted question, and I'll try to give a multifaceted answer. Thank you, thank you for your answer uh, question. Um, I think that we won't be able to give us our culture back. We will have to fight for it and reclaim it for ourselves. But you can stand beside us as we do that, you know, and you can stand in solidarity with us as we do that so much of the work only we can do, you know? And it's hard when, you know, my, my beloved relative here with me, Marcus, you know, our people in Diné homeland, our median household income is 30,000 a year. That's the median household income. That means half the population is making less than 30,000 a year. Uh, it's hard to reclaim your culture when a third of our people have no electricity or running water. Uh, it's hard to reclaim our culture when uh, homicide is the third leading cause of death for Native women. Uh, it's not even on the top 10 for white women or black women or Asian women, uh, but it's the third leading cause of death for our Native women because this country never gave a shit about us and they still don't. Well, actually that's not true. A lot more do <laughs> now, but we are the most trafficked, the most um, sex trafficked, human trafficked um, demographic in the country. So I speak here today, not just for myself, you know, but for my sisters who are going missing as we speak. Um, so uh, having said that, <laughs> even with all of these mountains in front of us, we're not gonna let that be an excuse for us to not win. We're gonna win and we're gonna keep on winning. We're winning right now. Just us in this room is a win, and I think we're gonna, you know, be in solidarity with everyone, every single person. And I think that, yeah, I don't think the world can give us back our culture, but they can stand beside us and support us as we reclaim it for ourselves. Um, and yeah, at the very least, just don't be in the way, you know, <laughs> which is what the American government has done for the past 500 years, or rather, you know, since 1776. But it's just, you know, uh, an exciting time, I think, to link arms, an exciting time to be, to forge alliances with the African diaspora here as well. The Afro-Indigenous movement is so exciting, uh, honoring how so many African 
looking people here in this continent are also Choctaw, Chickasaw, Tsalagi, uh, Seminole, you know, all kinds of different nations that are mixed, as well as folks who look white, you know. My father looks like a European man, but he's also has these native tribes in him. So uh, all of us honoring that part of ourselves and also honoring the diversity that we all, and the different pieces of the puzzle that we all bring to the table. You bring a piece, it's very important. Every single piece is important. And to give it to the Anishinaabe, also known as Ojibwe, but the, the deeper name, the true name is Anishinaabe people, you never know what's gonna happen. And I think that when, when, when you give the land back, and I think giving it to grassroots indigenous femme leaders um, is really important. Because the tribal governments, I hate to say it, are by and large wrapped up in the BIA or in corporations. They are the installment of American capitalism into our communities. Not always, but oftentimes. So giving the land and the resources to indigenous women who are grassroots community organizers, they're usually the ones who are down in the trenches making stuff happen with usually a shoestring budget. So. It's exciting that all the world is getting behind them, too. So um, thank you. Let's go ahead to the next question. Well, I want to thank you for being here tonight and for the uh, magic you bring to your presentation that includes song and poetry. Uh, but uh, first, I want to thank the student group that sponsored this tonight. I hear the land acknowledgment done for a lot of events on campus. And the Distinguished Lecture Series for a few years now has just been great at the way they embrace that and state it in a way that leaves the door open for really fulfilling it. And you know, it, that land acknowledgement comes out of this being the most archeological rich campus in the country. There are many village sites here, there's many mound sites, but in simply pointing those out, which I tend to do, uh, you miss something about the dignity of the people that created those the um, uh, the way they related to nature, the the sacred nature of this land uh, that's so different than the view of the colonizers. And I'm wondering what suggestions you have for those of us who aren't poets or uh, singers <laughs> to open up that understanding uh, to, so people can better appreciate what indigenous people, how they lived here, how they took care of the land, and why, you know, what is the opportunity for collaboration now that's part of that land acknowledgement? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. I think um, I, I may be a poet, but I, I lean on that because I'm really bad at everything else. So that's why you all need to do the other things. <laughs> Again, pieces of the puzzle. We all have a gift. The creator made each of us with a gift or gifts. And our goal in life used to be to find out what is that gift and give it to the world in need. And so um, each of us has a gift. Each of us has a network. Each of us has a circle. Each of us has a, uh, a pool of resources, be it not just financial, but um, an art gallery that could have an installment in it, um, you know, two hands that can build something, you know, whatever our, our, our gift is, you know. But I think in terms of the collaboration, uh, I think ideally number one is indigenous-led efforts. Um, one of the magic phrases that I given some trainings of like indigenous solidarity is how can I help if at all? You know, going to Janice or some other local, usually I lean on the women, uh, grassroots femme leaders, you know, and saying, how can I help if at all? And they might give you an answer you weren't expecting, you know. Sometimes they might say, honestly, we just need diapers. <laughs> you know, our, our mothers need diapers. We're not affording them right now. Or they might say, Oh, I've had this big vision for two decades to make a film about my grandmother's da 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 da, you know? And so standing behind the visions of indigenous people on the ground is the most um, non-colonial way to go about helping native people. 
Because sometimes we actually accidentally replicate, not not on purpose or any ill intent, but we we say, oh, I know what you need. I'm going to do this. Um, I'm going to be the planner of it. And you can come and say the land acknowledgement at the beginning and da 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 but instead of saying what is what is your vision what is your dream and i think that becomes more important in native communities because we've had our agency stripped from us for centuries where in in our people's case in 1864 they put us in a concentration camp for 4 years and thousands of us died there. and they only let us out of the camp if we promised and signed a document saying they could have all of our children age six to 16. So we lost our children in order to get out of a death camp, you know, right outside of Albuquerque. So it's extra tender in the, I would say in the indigenous community, this need for agency, this need for the ability to say, this is what we're gonna do for our community because that muscle has been taken away oftentimes. We don't get to say what our future is gonna look like and how we're gonna get there. So I think in terms of collaboration, the magic words are, how can I help if at all? And then you listen for the answer and then you get behind that. And native people will learn too, you know, cause we don't always get to exercise or uh, um, implement our visions. We don't always get to, to bring them to fruition cause maybe we were never asked or maybe we don't have the space. So we might cut our teeth too a little bit and, and maybe make some mistakes. But over time, if we keep asking native communities that question, how can I help if at all? I think uh, an indigenous led collaboration will sprout. And I, that's what my elders told me is probably the best way you know, to collaborate. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we're running low on time. So yeah, no, I talked too be, long. This Sorry. is gonna be our last question okay. over here. Sorry. Oh, there's two at once. Sorry. I just wanted to say thank you, and thank you for sharing your grandmother with us. Yeah. Um, just really quickly, I heard uh, an, an Oneida elder talk about that when people were forcibly removed from their land, that they lost some of the things about knowing a place, you know, of knowing. And so these languages sometimes speak to a place that people are no longer on. Mm -hmm. Is there, um, in your work, are you thinking about how that can be reclaimed for people that have a language but may no longer be on the land that it describes, that mm -hmm. that connection can be made? I know that's a complicated question. I'm happy to email you, but I'm mm -hmm. very excited about what you're doing, not only mm -hmm. for the, your culture, but for everyone's, mm -hmm. because you uh, speak of hope and building and that we're all belonging versus we're all apart. Yeah. And that is not something that I am hearing in other places, so thank you. I can email you too, but I am curious. Like, where are you gonna take this? What is, where are you, what are you going to do next? Yeah, um, I think to, for your first, thank you, thank you. For your first question, I think, I think it's that people back thing. You know, like a lot of the Oklahoma nations um, are not in their traditional land, so I think bringing people back to their lands. And that's what the Muscogee are doing right now. They bought over a thousand acres in Alabama and they started a language immersion school there, an eco-village language immersion school. So bringing people back home is, according to the, that Muscogee guy, the only way to, to truly live your language. That doesn't mean you can't still do things in a diasporic context, and I think we still should, but I think at least trying to also connect people back to their original lands. Because the Muscogee were moved to Oklahoma and now they're all going back to Alabama. Um, so it's very exciting. Uh, not all of them, but you know, they're, they're creating this land base. Um, so um, second question, where am I going? What am I doing? Uh, I just want to rest for a while and I want to help create a, a university for native knowledge and an indigenous women's Congress. And I think that's the main two goals for now and just maybe have a family someday you know been working too hard and still you know childless and stuff so maybe rest a little bit and have a have a life <laughs> um but I, I yeah one more do we want to do that is that what's going on okay yeah, oh yeah it's a 
Thank you very much for doing the presentation. It was insightful. You have been listening to your elders, to your grandparents, and teaching. You're teaching all of that. I'm very grateful as a Navajo person. Thank you very much. Yeah, and Sago, she, 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 auto. Um, I love the way you said, uh, as on the Jone, but on I'm gonna, I'm gonna pick up that one, but um, no, I, I think I'll just close by saying all of this is from the the DN Anything good I have is from the DN and 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 it's always very awkward being up here at the podium because it's not about me. It's yeah. about the DN and it's about the earth. And, um, and you know, I, I started doing drugs and alcohol when I was 11 years old. Uh, I was a drug addict by the time I got to Stanford and an alcoholic. And I, I'm just, anything I say here is literally because of the miracles that the DN did to help get me sober. I celebrate 10 years next month of sobriety. And so any goodness here is not from me. I'm just I'm just grateful to be alive, honestly, and I'm happy. Oh. You've been truly blessed. Thank you. And yes. We have to. Thank you. Thank you all so much for your time tonight. Have a good night and drive home safe. And thank you.